Dylan Thomas was born on the 27th of October 1914 at number 5 Kumdonkin Drive, Uplands, Swansea, in the front bedroom of this semi-detached house. He was the son of Florence Hannah, nay Williams, and David John Thomas, a teacher. His father had a first-class honours degree in English and ambitions to rise above his position teaching English literature at the local grammar school. Thomas had a sister Nancy who was eight years older than him. The children spoke only English, though their parents were bilingual in English and Welsh. Dylan's father chose the name Dylan, which could be translated as son of the sea, after Dylan Ale Don, a character in the Mabinog Eon. His middle name, Marlice, was given in honor of his great uncle, Gwilym Thomas, a Unitarian minister and poet whose bardic name was Gwilym Marles. As a child, he would have regular summer trips to Welsh speaking Carmarthenshire, where his maternal relatives were the sixth generation to farm there. The memory of Fern Hill, a dilapidated 15 acre farm rented by his maternal aunt and Jones, and her husband, Jim, is evoked in the 1945 poem, Fern Hill but is portrayed more accurately in his short story, The Peaches. Thomas' paternal grandparents, and Anne Evan Thomas, lived at the Poplars in Johnstown, just outside Carmarthen. Anne was the daughter of William Lewis, a gardener in the town. And her father, who is thought to be Grandpa, in Dylan's short story, A Visit to Grandpa's. Dylan Thomas had bronchitis and asthma in childhood and struggled with these throughout his life. He was indulged by his mother, Florence, and enjoyed being mollycoddled, a trait he carried into adulthood, becoming skillful in gaining attention and sympathy. But if he was protected and spoilt at home, the real spoilers were his many aunts and older cousins, both those in Swansea and in the Carmarthen countryside. Some of them played an important part in both his upbringing and later life, as Dylan's wife, Caitlin, observed. He couldn't stand their company for more than five minutes, yet Dylan couldn't break away from them, either. They were the background from which he had sprung, and he needed that background all his life, like a tree needs roots. Thomas's formal education began at Mrs. Hole's Dame School, a private school on Mirador Crescent, Uplands, Swansea. He described his experience there in reminiscences of childhood. Never was there such a Dame School as ours, so firm and kind and smelling of galoshes, with the sweet and fumbled music of the piano lessons drifting down from upstairs to the lonely schoolroom, where only the sometimes tearful wicked sat over undone sums, or to repent a little crime, the pulling of a girl's hair during geography, the sly shin kick under the table during English literature. Alongside the dame school, Dylan also took private lessons from Gwen James, an elocution teacher who had studied at drama school in London, winning several major prizes. She also taught dramatic art and voice production and would often help cast members of the Swansea Little Theatre with the parts they were playing. In October 1925, Dylan Thomas enrolled at Swansea Grammar School for Boys in Mount Pleasant, where his father taught English. He was an undistinguished pupil who shied away from school, preferring reading and drama activities. In his first year one of his poems was published in the school's magazine, and before he left he became its editor. During his final school years he began writing poetry in notebooks, the first poem, dated the 27th April 1930, is entitled, Osiris, Come to Isis. In June 1928, he won the school's mile race, held at St. Helen's Ground, he carried a newspaper photograph of his victory with him until his death. In 1931, when he was 16, he left school to become a reporter for the South Wales Daily Post, where he remained for some 18 months. After leaving the newspaper, he continued to work as a freelance journalist for several years, during which time he remained at Kumdonkin Drive and continued to add to his notebooks, amassing 200 poems in four books between 1930 and 1934. Of the 90 poems he published, half were written during these years. The stage was also an important part of his life from 1929 to 1934, as an actor, writer, producer and set painter. He took part in productions at Swansea Grammar School, and with the YMCA Junior Players and the Little Theatre, which was based in the Mumbles. Between October 1933 and March 1934, Thomas and his fellow actors took part in five productions at the Mumbles Theatre, as well as nine touring performances. Thomas continued with acting and production throughout his life, including his time in Larne, South Lee and London both in the theatre and on radio, 
as well as taking part in nine stage readings of Under Milk Wood. Painting the sets at the Little Theatre was just one aspect of the young Dylan's interest in art. His own drawings and paintings hung in his bedroom in Kumdongkin Drive, and his early letters reveal a broader interest in art and art theory. He saw writing a poem as an act of construction, as a sculptor works at stone. Throughout his life, his friends included artists, both in Swansea and in London, as well as in America. In his free time, he visited the cinema in Uplands, took walks along Swansea Bay, and frequented Swansea's pubs. At the Cardoma Cafe, close to the newspaper office in Castle Street, he met his creative contemporaries, including his friend the poet Vernon Watkins. The group of writers, musicians and artists became known as the Cardoma Gang. This was also the period of his friendship with Bert Trick, a local shopkeeper, left-wing political activist and would-be poet, with the Reverend Leon Atkin, a Swansea minister, human rights activist and local politician. Thomas was a teenager when many of the poems for which he became famous were published, and Death Shall Have No Dominion, Before I Knocked, and The Force That Through the Green Fuse Drives the Flower. The poem, And Death Shall Have No Dominion, appeared in the New English Weekly in May 1933. When Light Breaks Where No Sun Shines appeared in The Listener in 1934, it caught the attention of three senior figures in literary London, T. S. Eliot, Geoffrey Grigson and Stephen Spender. They contacted Dylan and his first poetry volume, 18 Poems, was published in December 1934. 18 Poems was noted for its visionary qualities which led to critic Desmond Hawkins writing that the work was the sort of bomb that bursts no more than once in three years. The volume was critically acclaimed and won a contest run by the Sunday referee, netting him new admirers from the London poetry world, including Edith Sitwell and Edwin Muir. The anthology was published by Fortune Press, in part a vanity publisher that did not pay its writers and expected them to buy a certain number of copies themselves. A similar arrangement was used by other new authors including Philip Larkin. In September 1935, Dylan Thomas met Vernon Watkins, and a lifelong friendship began. Dylan introduced Vernon Watkins, working at Lloyd's Bank at the time, to his friends, now known as the Cardoma Gang. In those days, Dylan Thomas used to frequent the cinema on Mondays with Tom Warner who, after these trips, Warner would bring Dylan back for supper with his aunt. On one occasion, when she served him a boiled egg, she had to cut its top off for him, as Dylan did not know how to do this. This was because his mother had done it for him all his life, an example of her coddling him. Years later, his wife Caitlin would still have to prepare his eggs for him. In December 1935, Dylan contributed the poem, The Hand That Signed the Paper, to issue 18 of the bi-monthly new verse. In 1936, his next collection 25 poems, published by J. M. Dent, also received much critical praise. In all, he wrote half his poems while living at Kumdonkin Drive before moving to London. It was the time that Dylan Thomas's reputation for heavy drinking developed. In early 1936, Dylan met Caitlin McNamara, a 22-year-old blonde-haired, blue-eyed dancer of Irish and French descent. She had run away from home, intent on making a career in dance, and aged 18 joined the chorus line at the London Palladium. Introduced by Augustus John, Caitlin's lover, they met in the Wheatsheaf pub on Rathbone Place in London's West End. Laying his head in her lap, the drunken Dylan Thomas proposed. Although Caitlin initially continued her relationship with John, she and Dylan Thomas began a correspondence, and in the second half of 1936 were courting. They married at the register office in Penzance, Cornwall, on the 11th of July 1937. In early 1938, they moved to Wales, renting a cottage in the village of Larne, Carmarthenshire. By the late 1930s, Dylan was embraced as the poetic herald for a group of English poets, the New Apocalyptics. He refused to align himself with them and declined to sign their manifesto. He later stated that he believed they were intellectual muckpots leaning on a theory. During the politically charged atmosphere of the 1930s, Dylan's sympathies were very much with the radical left, to the point of holding close links with the communists, as well as decidedly pacifist and anti-fascist. He was a supporter of the left-wing No More War movement and boasted about participating in demonstrations against the British Union of Fascists.
1938, Thomas won the Oscar Blumenthal Prize for Poetry. It was also the year in which New Directions offered to be his publisher in the United States. 1939 saw a collection of 16 poems and seven of the 20 short stories published by Dylan in magazines since 1934 appear as the map of love. Ten stories in his next book, Portrait of the Artist as a Young Dog, were based less on lavish fantasy than those in the map of love and more on real-life romances featuring himself in Wales. Sales of both books were poor, resulting in him living on meagre fees from writing and reviewing. At this time he borrowed heavily from friends and acquaintances. Hounded by creditors, he and his family left Larne in July 1940 and moved to the home of critic John Davenport in Marshfield, Gloucester. Dylan collaborated with Davenport on the satire, The Death of the King's Canary, though due to fears of libel the work was not published until 1976. At the outbreak of the Second World War his ailment, coughing sometimes confined him to bed, and he had a history of bringing up blood and mucus so he was classified grade 3, which meant that he would be among the last to be called up for service. Saddened to see his friends going on active service, he continued drinking and struggled to support his family. He wrote begging letters to random literary figures asking for support, a plan he hoped would provide a long-term regular income. Dylan supplemented his income by writing scripts for the BBC, which not only gave him additional earnings it also showed that he was engaged in essential war work. In February 1941, Swansea was bombed by the Germans in a three-nights blitz. Castle Street was one of many streets that suffered badly, rows of shops, including the Cardoma Café, were destroyed. Thomas walked through the bombed-out shell of the town centre with his friend Bert Trick. Upset at the sight, he concluded, our Swansea is dead. Soon after the bombing raids, he wrote a radio play, Return Journey Home, which described the cafe as being raised to the snow. The play was first broadcast on 15 June 1947. In five film projects, between 1942 and 1945, the Ministry of Information commissioned him to script a series of documentaries about both urban planning and wartime patriotism, in partnership with director John Eldridge, Green Mountain, Black Mountain, New Towns for Old, Fuel for Battle, Our Country, and A City Reborn. In May 1941, Thomas and Caitlin left their son with his grandmother at Blashford and moved to London. Thomas hoped to find employment in the film industry and wrote to the director of the film's division of the Ministry of Information. They declined his employment but he found work with Strand Films, providing him with his first regular income since the Daily Post. Strand produced films for the Ministry of Information, Thomas scripted at least five films in 1942, This Is Colour, A History of the British Dying Industry, and New Towns for Old, on post-war reconstruction. These Are the Men, 1943 was a more ambitious film in which his verse accompanies Lenny Riefenstahl's footage of an early Nuremberg rally. Conquest of a Germ, 1944, explored the use of early antibiotics in the fight against pneumonia and tuberculosis. Our Country, 1945, was a romantic tour of Britain set to his poetry. In early 1943, Thomas began a relationship with Pamela Glendower, one of several affairs he had during his marriage. The affairs either ran out of steam or were halted after Caitlin discovered his affairs. In March 1943, they lived in a rundown studio in Chelsea, made up of a single large room with a curtain to separate the kitchen. The Thomas family returned several times back to Wales. Between 1941 and 1943, they lived intermittently in Talsan, in Cardiganshire. In July 1944, with the threat in London of German flying bombs, he moved to the family cottage at Blankham, Carmarthenshire, and he resumed writing poetry, completing Holy Spring and Vision and Prayer. In September that year, the, the family moved to New Quay in Cardiganshire, where they rented Majoda on the cliffs overlooking Cardigan Bay. It was there that he wrote the radio piece quite early one morning, a sketch for his later work, Under Milk Wood. His nine months in New Quay, said first biographer, Constantine Fitzgibbon, were a second flowering, a period of fertility that recalls the earliest days with a great outpouring of poems, as well as a good deal of other material. His second biographer, Paul Ferris, concurred, on the grounds of output, the bungalow deserves a plaque of its own. Although Dylan Thomas had previously written for the BBC, 
it was an intermittent source of income. In 1943, he wrote and recorded a 15-minute talk titled Reminiscences of Childhood for the Welsh BBC. In December 1944, he recorded Quite Early One Morning, produced by Anirin Telfan Davies, again for the Welsh BBC, but when Davies offered it for national broadcast BBC London turned it down. On 31 August 1945, the BBC Home Service broadcast Quite Early One Morning and, in the three years beginning in October 1945, Dylan Thomas made over a hundred broadcasts for the corporation. He was employed not only for his poetry readings, but for discussions and critiques. In the second half of 1945, he began reading for the BBC radio programme, Book of Verse, broadcast weekly to the Far East. This provided him with a regular income and brought him into contact with Louis Magnese, a drinking companion whose advice he cherished. On 29 September 1946, the BBC began transmitting the third programme, a high-culture network which provided opportunities for Dylan. He appeared in the play, Comus, for the third programme, the day after the network launched, and his rich voice led to character parts, including the lead in Agamemnon and Satan in an adaptation of Paradise Lost. He was a popular guest on radio talk shows for the BBC, who regarded him as useful should a younger generation poet be needed. He had an uneasy relationship with BBC management and a staff job was never an option, with drinking cited as the problem. Despite this, he was a familiar radio voice and within Britain was, in every sense, a celebrity. By late September 1945, the Thomases had left Wales and were living with various friends in London. In December, they moved to Oxford to live in a summer house on the banks of the Sharewell. It belonged to the historian A.J.P. Taylor. His wife, Margaret, would prove to be Thomas' most committed patron. The publication of Deaths and Entrances in February 1946 was a major turning point for him. Poet and critic Walter J. Turner commented in The Spectator, this book alone, in my opinion, ranks him as a major poet. The following year, in April 1947, the Thomases travelled to Italy, after Dylan had been awarded a Society of Authors scholarship. They stayed first in villas near Apollo and then Florence, before moving to a hotel in Rio Marina on the island of Elba. On their return in September 1947, they moved into the manor house in Southleigh, just west of Oxford, found for him by Margaret Taylor. He continued with his work for the BBC completed a number of film scripts and worked further on his ideas for Under Milk Wood, including a discussion in late 1947 of The Village of the Mad, as the play was then called, with BBC producer Philip Burton. Burton later recalled that, during the meeting, Thomas had discussed his ideas for having a blind narrator, an organist who played for a dog and two lovers who wrote to each other every day but never met. In March 1949 Dylan Thomas travelled to Prague. He had been invited by the Czech government to attend the inauguration of the Czechoslovak Writers' Union, who had previously published translations of some of his poems. A month later, in May 1949, Dylan and his family moved to his final home, the boathouse at Lahn, purchased for him at a cost of £2,500 in April 1949 by Margaret Taylor. Thomas had suffered from chest problems for most of his life, though they began in earnest soon after he moved in May 1949, to the boathouse, the Bronchial Heronry, as he called it. Within weeks of moving in, he visited a local doctor who prescribed medicine for both his chest and throat. Thomas acquired a garage a hundred yards from the house on a cliff ledge which he turned into his writing shed, and where he wrote several of his most acclaimed poems. He also rented Pelican House opposite his regular drinking den, Brown's Hotel, for his parents, who lived there from 1949 until 1953. American poet John Brennan invited Thomas to New York, and in 1950 they embarked on a lucrative three-month tour of art centers and campuses. The tour, which began in front of an audience of a thousand at the Kaufman Auditorium of the Poetry Center in New York, took in about 40 venues. During the tour, Dylan was invited to many parties and functions and it was said that on several occasions became drunk, going out of his way to shock people and was a difficult guest. Writer Elizabeth Hardwick recalled how intoxicating a performer he was and how the tension would build before a performance, would he arrive only to break down on the stage? Would some dismaying scene take place at the faculty party? <laughs>
Would he be offensive, violent, obscene? Caitlin said in her memoir, nobody ever needed encouragement less, and he was drowned in it. On returning to Britain, he began work on two further poems, In the White Giant's Thigh and The Incomplete, In Country Heaven. In October, he sent a draft of the first 39 pages of The Town That Was Mad to the BBC. The task of seeing this work through to production was assigned to the BBC's Douglas Cleverdon, who had been responsible for casting him in Paradise Lost. Despite Cleverdon's urgings, the script slipped from Thomas's priorities and in early 1951 he took a trip to Iran to work on a film for the Anglo-Iranian oil company. The film was never made, and Dylan returned to Wales in February, though his time there allowed him to provide a few minutes of material for a BBC documentary, Persian Oil. Early that year, he wrote two poems, which his biographer, Paul Ferris, describes as unusually blunt, the ribald lament and an ode, in the form of a villanelle, to his dying father, do not go gentle into that good night. Despite a range of wealthy patrons, including Margaret Taylor, Princess Marguerite Kitani and Marge Howard Stepney, he was still in financial difficulty and he wrote several begging letters to notable literary figures including the likes of T.S. Eliot. Taylor was not keen on Dylan taking another trip to the United States, and thought that if she had a permanent address in London he would be able to gain steady work there. She bought a property, 54 Delancey Street in Camden Town, and in late 1951 he and Caitlin lived in the basement flat. He described the flat as his London house of horror and did not return there after his 1952 tour of America. Dylan Thomas undertook a second tour of the United States in January 1952, this time with Caitlin after she had discovered he had been unfaithful on his earlier trip. They drank heavily, and Thomas began to suffer with gout and lung problems. The second tour was intensive, taking in 46 engagements. On this trip Dylan recorded his first poetry to vinyl, which Keedman Records released in America later that year. One of his works recorded during this time, Child's Christmas in Wales, became his most popular prose work in America. On 10 November 1952 Dylan's last collection, Collected Poems, 1934-1952, was published, he was 38. Thomas's father died from pneumonia just before Christmas 1952. Dylan's third tour of America was on 9 October 1953. He called on his mother, Florence, to say goodbye he always felt that he had to get out from this country because of his chest being so bad. Whilst waiting for his flight from London to America in October 1953, he stayed with the comedian Harry Locke and worked on Under Milkwood. Locke noted that Thomas was having trouble with his chest, terrible, coughing fits that made him go purple in the face. He was also using an inhaler to help his breathing. There were reports, too, that he was also having blackouts. His visit to the BBC producer Philip Burton, a few days before he left for New York, was interrupted by a blackout. On his last night in London, he had another in the company of his fellow poet Louis McNeese. Dylan arrived in New York on 20 October 1953 to undertake further performances of Under Milk Wood, organized by John Brinin, his American agent and director of the Poetry Center. Brinin did not travel to New York but remained in Boston to write. He handed responsibility to his assistant, Liz Raytel, who was keen to see Dylan Thomas for the first time since their three-week romance early in the year. She met Thomas at Idlewild Airport and was shocked at his appearance. He looked pale, delicate and shaky, not his usual robust self, he was very ill when he got here. After being taken by Raytel to check in at the Chelsea Hotel, Dylan took the first rehearsal of Under Milkwood. They then went to the White Horse Tavern in Greenwich Village, before returning to the Chelsea Hotel. The next day, Raytel invited him to her apartment, but he declined. They went sightseeing, but Thomas felt unwell and retired to his bed for the rest of the afternoon. Raytel gave him half a grain, 32.4 milligrams of phenobarbitone to help him sleep and spent the night at the hotel with him. Two days later, on the 23rd of October, at the third rehearsal, Dylan said he was too ill to take part, but he struggled on, shivering and burning with fever, before collapsing on the stage. The following day, the 24th of October, Raytel took him to see her doctor, Milton Feltenstein, 
who administered cortisone injections and Dylan made it through the first performance that evening, but collapsed immediately afterwards. This circus out there, he told a friend who had come backstage, has taken the life out of me for now. Raytel later said that Feltenstein was rather a wild doctor who thought injections would cure anything. At the next performance on the 25th of October, his fellow actors realized that Dylan was very ill. He was desperately ill, we didn't think that he would be able to do the last performance because he was so ill, Dylan literally couldn't speak he was so ill, still my greatest memory of it is that he had no voice. On the evening of the 27th of October, Dylan Thomas attended his 39th birthday party but felt unwell and returned to his hotel after an hour. The next day, he took part in poetry and the film, a recorded symposium at Cinema 16. A turning point came on the 2nd of November. Air pollution in New York had risen significantly and exacerbated chest illnesses such as Dylan's. By the end of the month, over 200 New Yorkers had died from the smog. On the 3rd of November, Dylan spent most of the day in his room, entertaining various friends. He went out in the evening to keep two drink appointments. After returning to the hotel, he went out again for a drink at 2 a.m. After drinking at the White Horse, he returned to the Hotel Chelsea, declaring, I've had 18 straight whiskies. I think that's the record. The barman and the owner of the pub who served him later commented that he could not have drunk more than half that amount. Dylan had an appointment at a clam house in New Jersey with Todd on the 4th of November. When Todd telephoned the Chelsea that morning, Dylan said he was feeling ill and postponed the engagement. Todd thought he sounded terrible. The poet, Harvey Bright, was another to phone that morning. He thought that Thomas sounded bad. Dylan's voice, recalled Bright, was low and hoarse. He had wanted to say, you sound as though from the tomb, but instead he told Dylan that he sounded like Louis Armstrong. Later, Dylan Thomas went drinking with Raytel at the White Horse and, feeling sick again, returned to the hotel. Feltenstein came to see him three times that day, administering the cortisone secret ant. ACTH by injection and, on his third visit, half a grain, 32.4 milligrams of morphine sulfate, which affected Dylan's breathing. Raytel became increasingly concerned and telephoned Feltenstein for advice. He suggested she get male assistance, so she called upon the painter Jack Helica, who arrived before 11 p.m. At midnight on the 5th of November, Dylan Thomas's breathing became more difficult and his face turned blue. Raytel phoned Feltenstein who arrived at the hotel at about 1 a.m. and called for an ambulance. It then took another hour for the ambulance to arrive at St. Vincent's Hospital even though it was only a few blocks from the Chelsea. Thomas was admitted to the emergency ward at St. Vincent's Hospital at 1.58 a.m. He was comatose and his medical notes state that the impression upon admission was acute alcoholic encephalopathy damage to the brain by alcohol for which the patient was treated without response. Feltenstein then took control of Thomas's care, even though he did not have admitting rights at St. Vincent's. The hospital's senior brain specialist, Dr. C.G. Gutierrez Mahoney, was not called to examine Dylan Thomas until the afternoon of 6 November, some 36 hours after his admission. Caitlin flew to America the following day and was taken to the hospital, by which time a tracheotomy had been performed. Her reported first words were, is the bloody man dead yet? She was allowed to see Thomas only for 40 minutes in the morning. Dylan Thomas died at noon on the 9th of November, having never recovered from his coma. He died before the BBC could record under milk wood. It is now believed that Dylan Thomas had been suffering from bronchitis, pneumonia, emphysema and asthma before his admission to St. Vincent's. The medical notes indicate that, on admission, Dylan's bronchial disease was found to be very extensive, affecting upper, mid and lower lung fields, both left and right. At the post-mortem, the pathologist found three causes of death, pneumonia, brain swelling and a fatty liver. Despite the poet's heavy drinking, his liver showed no sign of cirrhosis. His body was brought back to Wales for burial in the village churchyard at Larne. Dylan Thomas's funeral, which Brynin did not attend, took place at St. Martin's Church in Larne on 24 November. Six friends from the village carried his coffin. Caitlin, without her customary hat, walked behind the coffin, 
with his childhood friend Daniel Jones at her arm and her mother by her side. The procession to the church was filmed and the wake took place at Brown's Hotel. Dylan's fellow poet and longtime friend Vernon Watkins wrote the Times obituary. The shock of Dylan Thomas's death moved composer Ivor Stravinsky, they had met in Boston in 1953. In 1954 he composed his, in memoriam Dylan Thomas for tenor, string quartet and four trombones. Under Milkwood won the Prix Italia for literary or dramatic programs in 1954. Dylan Thomas died intestate, with assets worth £100. Dylan Thomas's widow, Caitlin, died in 1994, and was buried alongside him. His father, DJ, died on 16 December 1952, and his mother Florence in August 1958. Thomas's elder son, Llewellyn, died in 2000, his daughter, Aaron Wee in 2009 and his youngest son Colm in 2012.